uh, and uh, the Bowles Simp Simpson Commission. Please join us in a very uh, simple uh, idea, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves the balance of his time. Gentleman from California. I rise, Mr. Chairman, to claim the time in opposition. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I yield myself one minute. Gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I oppose the Conyers Amendment. The F-35B is a short takeoff and vertical landing variant of the F-35 stealth fighter, and it's in the final stages of development and has entered low-rate initial production. The F-35B will operate from large-deck amphibious ships as well as have the capability to operate from forward operating bases and damaged airstrips to support Marine Corps ground maneuver forces ashore. The Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Amos, wrote to the committee yesterday and said the importance of the F-35B short takeoff vertical landing variant to the Marine Corps and the nation cannot be overstated. The F-35B has made significant progress in the last year under General Amos' uh, guidance by completing all of the planned test points in 2011 and accomplishing 260 vertical landings. If passed, this amendment could have major negative impacts to our nation's future combat power increase the cost of the overall F-35 program and negatively affect the eight international program partners and in foreign military sales. I urge my colleagues to vote no on the Conyers Amendment. Gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Chairman, I yield two minutes to uh, my co-sponsor of the amendment, the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Ellison. The gentleman from Minnesota is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I don't stand up here before you uh, representing myself as some great expert on airplanes, but I am a member of this body who is very concerned about the deficit and about spending, and we must save money, particularly where we need to. Now, when the Simpson Bowles Commission says that this particular airplane is not necessary and should be cut, and uh, recommendation 47, cancel the Marine Corps version of the F-35, I have to stop and take notice. When other organizations, many of which are fairly conservative groups, Taxpayers for Common Sense, the Cato Institute, no bleeding heart liberals there, the Project for Government Oversight, the National Taxpayers Union, the National, the Project on Defense Alternatives, and the Center for American Progress all agree that this is a wasteful program which we can save money with I think we've got to stop and we've got to take notice. Now, I noticed my colleague on the other side of the aisle was making some very good points, and they sound very similar to some points I read earlier today from a memo from somebody from Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin is a private contractor who uh, is uh, making the um, program, and the talking points that they sent out are very, are, I mean, they're essentially arguing so that they can ensure a commercial success of their particular project, which they have a financial interest in. But they make no claim of cost. They do not say that this is an exorbitant expense that people who have an eye toward budget are saying is not worth the money. Uh, we're not asking for F-35A or F-35C to be cut, but we are saying that this particular program, where there's a diverse and broad range of parties who say that this is not a necessary program should be cut and can be replaced by other good alternatives. I think we need to pay attention to that, and I'm sure my friends who repeat constantly that we're broke, we're broke, we're broke would agree. I yield back. Gentleman from California. I reserve. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, I yield at this time one minute to my friend and colleague, member of the committee, chairman of the Veterans Affairs Committee, gentleman from Florida, Mr. Miller. One minute. Gentleman, Florida is recognized for one minute. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I first want to start off by inviting my colleagues that oppose the F-35B uh, to visit Eglin Air Force Base in the Florida Panhandle, home of the 33rd Fighter Wing, where the sixth operational F-35B was recently delivered. The aircraft are performing well, and this year is exceeding program expectations. Look, the F-35B is a tactical strike aircraft that will, in fact, enable our Marines to defeat and deter advanced threats well into the future. The groups that you don't hear the opponents talk about is the fact that the President supports it, the Secretary of Defense says we need it, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff say we need it, the Commandant of the Marine Corps says we need it, 
And nobody is saying that the, uh, the F-18 out there is not a highly capable fourth generation aircraft, but it has been meeting our needs for three decades now. The F-35B is designed to defeat the threats of our adversaries that they are developing today. If we are to maintain our air superiority and defeat 21st century threats, we need more than a 20th century aircraft. I yield back. Gentleman from Michigan. Uh, I yield myself one and a half minutes. Gentleman has one and a half minutes remaining. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, the uh, incredible number of organizations and people and members of uh, both uh, Democratic and Republican House and Senate that have called the F-35B program a scandal and a tragedy. That's quoting the senior senator from Arizona, Senator McCain. Undersecretary Frank Kendall has referred to the process of developing and producing the F-35 as acquisition malpractice, quote unquote. And then even worse, the serious performance issues uh, that have caused uh, in 2010 Secretary Gates to stop production and place the program on two years probation. And according to the department's figures, the F-35 5B has driven cost overruns and is directly responsible for schedule delays in the overall development program. And it isn't even qualified to participate in close air support mission for the Marine Corps, Corps needs. It's far too vulnerable for this role which requires low, slow flying. The Marines would be much better served to utilize the Army's excess A-10s, which have a far superior range and payload capabilities. I reserve my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from California. I yield one minute at this time to my friend and colleague, the ranking member on the committee, the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Smith. The gentleman's recognized for one minute. Question. Uh, the F-35 has been a trouble program. It's been more expensive than we would like it to be uh, and has underperformed. It is getting better, as the chairman mentioned. There are a number of problems with this amendment, however. First of all, in replacing the F-35B, that's the Marine Corps variant. It's a vertical takeoff plank. The Marine Corps is an expeditionary force. I know Mr. Klein will do a much better job of explaining this in a moment than I will. Um, they need to insert themselves. That's why they need a vertical takeoff plane. The F-18 that is proposed to replace it is not a vertical takeoff. It is not a replacement for the F-35B. Second, the F-35 is a vastly more capable plane than the F-18. It is all about stealth and being able to get in on targets. The F-18 cannot get to the areas that the F-35 could get to to deal with adversaries like Iran or North Korea and their surface-to-air missiles. It is a much more capable plane. If we cut this variant, we will also jeopardize the entire program, not just this variant. Our foreign partners are likely to withdraw. It will undermine our per-unit cost to the point where sustaining the program will be very difficult. It is unfortunate at this point the degree to which we have to rely on this program, but it's going to be 95% of our fighter attack aircraft fleet in 10 years. We have to make it work. Now, therefore, I oppose this amendment. Gentleman from California. I yield uh, one minute to my friend and colleague, member of the committee, and chairman of the Education Committee and Marine pilot, the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Klein. The gentleman from Minnesota is recognized for one minute. I thank, the, <clears throat> I thank the gentleman for yielding. I thank the chair. Mr. Chairman, I rise today to oppose the gentleman's amendment and impress upon my colleagues the importance of the short takeoff vertical landing capability of the F-35 Bravo and its contribution to the continued success of the United States Marine Corps. Mr. Chairman, so many years ago as a young Marine and, and a young Marine pilot, I remember watching a jump jet, a Harrier, hovering over the ground. That Harrier, that AV-8A, went from being a novelty, growing and maturing to becoming an essential, integral part of the Marine Air Ground Team. That Harrier today is old and getting outdated and needs to be replaced. And similarly, I've watched the magic of the F-A-18. Fantastic, top of the line, front line fighter. Terrific aircraft. It can't take off and land vertically. 
It doesn't have the capability, and we need those capabilities that the ranking member, Mr. Smith, talked about, the stealth capability, the advanced capability, to become that integral part of the Marine Air Ground Team. So I encourage my colleagues to support the continued development of the F-35B and oppose the gentleman's amendment, and I yield back. Gentleman from California. Gentleman from Michigan's time has expired. Gentleman from California has one minute remaining. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield one minute to my friend and colleague, member of the committee, the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Courtney. Gentleman from Connecticut is recognized for one minute. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank the chairman for yielding for a minute. Uh, again, all the points about why this program, which had, had some, was struggling a couple of years ago, is now uh, really shown great promise in terms of the tests that uh, show that a lot of the criticisms that we've heard on the floor really, to some degree, um, are out of date. In, with all due respect to the proponents. And I think it's just important for people to recognize that we made a decision as a country a number of years ago to cancel the F-22 program, that the, the fifth generation uh, program of the future is going to be the F-35. And there are many other nations around the world, frankly, that are watching this debate, Australia, our European allies, who are all going to participate in the Joint Strike Fighter program. I think it is critically important that we make a statement that we are going to move forward with this program. Their navies, their aircraft carriers are also going to be investing in these uh, uh, platforms and uh, again, with the progress that's being made, uh, again, I think it's important for us to, to s send a strong signal internationally that this is a program America is going to continue to invest in. Again, I respectfully uh, rise to oppose this amendment and urge a no vote. And I yield back. All time has expired. The question occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Michigan. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. No. Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. It is now in order to consider amendment number 10. Printed in House Report 112-485. For what purpose does the gentleman from Illinois seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number 10, printed in House Report number 112-485, offered by Mr. Quigley of Illinois. Pursuant to House Resolution 661, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to offer an amendment with my friend from Illinois, Mr. Gutierrez, to cut funding for the V-22 Osprey and put the savings toward deficit reduction. As many know, the Osprey has a long and troubled past. According to the 2009 GAO Office Report, the Osprey was not suited to fly safely in extreme heat, excessive sand, or under enemy fire. The GAO also found that the Osprey was 186% over budget, costing over $100 million per unit to produce, or five times more than the Sea Knight helicopter it was designed to replace. More recently, the Pentagon testing found that the readiness rate of the V-22 was well below that of traditional aircraft, noting its, quote, average mission capable rate was 53% from June of 2007 to May of 2010, well below the required rate of 82%. Sadly, due to these severe shortcomings, the V-22 has taken the lives of 36 individuals, including 31 service members. Just last month, two Marines lost their lives when an Osprey crashed in Morocco. Now, I understand that since the 2009 report, a number of improvements have been made. Costs are being reduced and safety is being improved. I also understand the unique benefits of the V-22 can provide to our service members, especially for rescue operations. But these operations can be completed with less expensive helicopters. And here's the bottom line. We are emer emerging from a recession. We have a deficit topping $1 trillion for four straight years. And we have limited resources, which means we have to make choices. And we, as we look to reduce our deficit, we have to put everything on the table, including defense. Defense spending comprises close to 20% of our budget, and yet this defense authorization completely exempts any cuts from defense. In fact, it actually, it fact, it actually increases spending by over $4 billion over the President's request. We have to take a hard look at what we are spending and ask ourselves, is this essential? Given its continued cost overruns, poor safety record, and the fact that it can be replaced with less expensive helicopters, I think it is clear that the V-22 is not essential. As be at best, it is suboptimal. It is certainly not essential. 
and I am not alone. President George H.W. Bush tried to zero out funding for the V-22. The Congress wouldn't let him. Former Defense Secretary Dick Cheney tried to zero out funding for the V-22. The Congress wouldn't let him. And now the President's Bipartisan Fiscal Commission, the Bipartisan Policy Commission, and the Sustainable Defense Task Force have all recommended cutting the V-22 and replacing it with less expensive MH-60 helicopters. But the reality is, one of the reasons we block cuts to the V-22 is because 2,000 companies make supply parts for the Osprey from 40 states. I get it. The Department of Defense has become a jobs program. If all we're worried about is job creation, we'd be better off building bridges and transit programs. Because in the end, we have to remember the big picture. Choosing to fund this over-budget, dangerous, non-essential plane means cuts in other vital areas such as education, infrastructure, and health care. I encourage my colleagues to join me in scrutinizing this budget, setting priorities, and cutting programs that aren't essential in order to protect ones that are. This defense authorization bill includes a long list of non-essential programs, all of which should be cut. But a vote for my amendment to cut the over-budget, underperforming V-22 Osprey is a step in the right direction. I reserve. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, I rise in, uh, in claiming the opposition, time in opposition. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I yield uh, one minute to my friend and colleague, member of the committee from Maryland, Mr. Bartlett. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized for one minute. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if we don't buy these aircraft, it doesn't mean that we won't be buying other rotorcraft because there are missions that must be accomplished. Uh, this uh, airplane will replace the CH-46E, and compared to the 46E, it has four times the range and carries twice as many combat-loaded personnel. So if the gentleman's goal of reducing spending, his amendment might result in exactly the opposite. Because obviously for many missions, this will be far and away the most efficient aircraft. Mr. Chairman, we need to reject this amendment because if we pass the amendment, it could very well result in increased cost to our military, not decreased cost, and less efficiency on many uh, missions. And I yield back. Gentleman from Illinois. I continue to reserve. Gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, I yield at this time to the uh, gentleman, ranking member of the committee, Mr. Smith from Washington, one minute. Gentleman's recognized for one minute. The V-22 was a, a trouble program, uh, certainly before it was finally developed and went through a number of difficulties. Uh, but as the gentleman mentioned in offering the amendment, it has gotten over those difficulties and, in fact, has been deployed in Afghanistan uh, for a very long time. I was in Afghanistan. I rode on a V-22. Um, so it can obviously perform in uh, ver desert environments. It was down in Helmand province. Um, it's a very capable plane. And again, it has to do with the Marine Corps and the Marine Corps' capabilities. They are an expeditionary force. Uh, the vertical takeoff and landing ability of the V-22 is critical to what they do. As Mr. Bartlett pointed out, it has longer range, greater capacity, and properly deployed and properly used can actually make it cheaper than buying more helicopters that are necessary to accomplish that mission. Um, it is a necessary program, certainly necessary for the Marine Corps. I would urge opposition to the amendment, and I yield back my time. Gentleman from Illinois. I reserve. Gentleman reserve. Gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, I yield one minute to my friend and colleague, the gentleman from Texas, Vice Chairman of the Committee, Mr. Thorne. The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I have before me an article from AOL Defense uh, from just a few months ago, which was written by Richard Whittle, who wrote a whole book on the V-22. And as the editor says, he, this is as close to ground truth of the V-22 as one can get. What he says is that the Marines and the Air Force Special Operations Command have been flying it in combat zones for four years, and they love it. He goes on to talk about problems in the early years, but the, the critics went to sleep in the middle of the story. In other words, they have not recognized the significant improvements that, the, that several people have talked about. 
Since, since October 1, 2001, the military has lost 405 helicopters. 99% of them have not been V-22s, and yet this amendment comes only against the V-22 when it turns out the redesigned, retested Osprey safety record is the safest rotorcraft the Marine Corps flies based on mishaps per 100,000 flight hours. When it comes to cost, the, since, night, since 2008, they are under budget and are actually going to save the taxpayers over $200 million versus what was budgeted. This plane is working well. This amendment is behind the times. Gentleman from Illinois. Gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, I yield one minute to my friend and colleague from uh, Pennsylvania, Mr. Meehan. Gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for yielding. And, Mr. Chairman, I rise uh, strongly to oppose the Quigley Amendment uh, in this particular matter. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the V-22, on behalf of the Marines who are using it in the theater of battle where it has proven itself. Indeed, if this argument was taking place in 2009, there might be a case to be made, but it's being made in 2012, where, in fact, I've got the testimony of the Commandant of the Marine Corps. The Ospreys given the United States unprecedented agility and operational reach unmatched by any other tactical aircraft. The Osprey is the cornerstone of the Marine Ground Task Force. More significantly, with regard to cost savings, it has procured under a multi-year procurement contract it will actually save a proposed $825 million over single-year contracts, providing required capability for the Marine Corps. In addition, if we tried to replace it, there would be 74 percent more cost associated. Reliability, cost, dependability, proof. I urge my colleagues to support the retention of the V-22. The gentleman from Illinois has one minute remaining. The gentleman from California has one minute remaining in the right to close. We have the right to close. The gentleman from California has the right to close. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman is recognized for one minute. The fact remains, studies still show this is a dangerous vehicle. Studies still show it is suboptimal. Studies still show it is wildly overcost. I want to help the Marines. I want to save Marine lives, and that's why this amendment is appropriate. It is, in the end, still dangerous pork with wings. Thank you. Chairman from California. Mr. Chairman, uh, we have one minute left. I yield that minute to my friend and colleague, gentleman from Pennsylvania, member of the committee, Mr. Brady. Gentleman's recognized for one minute. I'll meet the time. Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition along with my colleague, Mr. Fatah, uh, to this amendment. The V-22 Osprey program is truly a revolutionary system that is being used around the world today by both our United States Marine Corps and the Special Operations Command in support of our nation's missions. This amendment would, only, would eliminate the only cost-effective way to replace the fleet of aging medium lift aircraft in our inventory. Canceling V-22 does not remove the requirement to replace legacy CH-46 and HH-53 airframes. It would only interrupt the careful plan transition to a more capable and more cost-efficient alternative and an additional expense to the American taxpayer. I quote the United States Air Force Special Operations Commander, Command Commander, Lieutenant General Donald Worcester. This aircraft is the single most sufficient transformation of Air Force Special Operations since the induction of the helicopter. Nearly every mission we have faced in the last 20 years would have been done better and faster with the V-22. Mr. Chairman, who are we sitting here guarding and completely safe to not listen to the brave men and women and the commander and not give them everything they need and request to keep them safe and give them the tools to do their job? I urge you to support the President's budget request and vote no on the amendment. Uh, you back to balance my time. Question Again, occurs on chair. the amendment offered by the gentleman from Illinois. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The noes have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. Without objection, the committee will rise informally. House will be in order. The chair will receive a message. The chair will receive a message. Madam Speaker, a message from the Senate. Madam Speaker. Madam Secretary. I have been directed by the Senate to inform the House that the Senate has passed without amendment 
Age of 4849, cited as the Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Park Backcountry Access Act, in which the concurrence of the House is requested. The, the committee will resume its sitting. Come to order. It is now in order to consider Amendment Number 11, printed in House Report 112-485. What purpose does the gentleman from Massachusetts seek recognition? Uh, I rise uh, in support of my amendment, Mr. Chairman. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment Number 11, printed in House Report Number 112-485, offered by Mr. Markey of Massachusetts. Pursuant to House Resolution 661, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts. I thank the gentleman, and I uh, yield myself as much time as I may consume. Here's what my amendment says. Why are we building a new nuclear bomber? It's 2012. The B-52s that we have, 93 of them, are going to last until 2040. The B-2s we have are going to last until 2058. That's when they begin to retire. Now, of all the things America doesn't need right now, it's a brand new nuclear bomber. And so we're talking about cutting Medicare or Medicaid out here on the floor. There's not enough money to invest in research to find the cure for Alzheimer's. But we need a new nuclear bomber for $18 billion. It makes no sense. It's insane. We don't even have any more targets to hit them with. Every single nuclear submarine we have has 96 independently targetable nuclear warheads on board. That's 96 cities in the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union destroyed, 96 cities in China destroyed by one submarine. And we already have 93 B-52s. We have 20 B-2s. We have ICBMs ready to launch. And they want to build a new bomber. A nuclear bomber with nuclear bombs. By the time the, nu the new nuclear bomb arrives, there'll be no, no place to hit. All the old bombers, all the nuclear submarines will have hit all the targets. The boom we should be listening to is the baby boom. We need money for Medicare. We need money for Medicaid. We need money for Social Security. We need, need money to invest in finding the cure for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. That's the boom that's going to hit American families. That's the fear people have. The fear that people have is not that they're going to be in a nuclear war. The fear that people have is that there's going to be a terrifying call that comes into their family that tells them that they now have another case of Alzheimer's in their family, that it has not been cure cured. Each one of these bombers could double the size of the budget to find the cure for Alzheimer's. That's what we should be doing. That's the real terrorist that people are afraid of uh, coming into their lives. At this point, Mr. Chairman, I reserve the balance of my time. Chairman reserves the balance of his time. Mr. Chairman, I rise to claim time in opposition gentleman to the from gentleman's California is amendment. For five minutes. Uh, I, I just might note that the B-52s that have been around, that their grandchildren are flying now, that the original pilots flew, the B-2s, we have 20. I inquired the other day how many of them were ready to go on a mission maybe eight. So I think that uh, all of the talk about nuclear, they don't, the, the next bomber is the next generation bomber. It'll deliver all kinds of weapons, not just nuclear. I yield at this time two minutes to my friend and colleague, the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Fleming. The from Louisiana is recognized for two minutes. I, I thank the gentleman for yielding. Delaying development of the new bomber for 10 years would put the average age of the bomber fleet over 50 years old by the time a new bomber was fielded. Our oldest of which, the B-52, would be nearly 75 years old. It would create unacceptable levels of risk regarding power projection requirements and would affect our national security. The Air Force has only 19 B-2 stealth bombers in the inventory, but they are 1980s technology very maintenance intensive and very expensive to own and operate. The aircraft availability rate of the B-2 bomber fleet today being ready at a moment's notice for a mission is currently less than 40 percent. A mainstay of the U.S. global military power is the ability to conduct long-range conventional or nuclear strike missions anywhere in the world and against any type of threat. Therefore, it is an imperative to 
to maintain a credible bomber fleet. The Air Force plans to affordably develop, cost-effectively develop from off-the-shelf technology stuff that exists exist today instead of inventing new technologies which in the past have led to cost overruns. And I would say to the gentleman, don't just take my opinion. It's in the President's budget, so the administration obviously supports it. Uh, the Air Force says it's one of its top priorities. We're in a day when oftentimes Congress wants things for the Pentagon that the Pentagon doesn't want. In this case, the Pentagon, the Air Force, wants it. But let me quote what the Air Force said. Delaying the long-range strike bomber program for 10 years would create unacceptable levels of risk in our ability to direct support, future power projection requirements, significantly impacting national security. The long-range bomber will possess unique capabilities including long-range significant payload capacity, operational flexibility, and survivability in anti-access environments. It will replace existing bomber aircraft, some of which will be over six decades old when the long-range strike bomber reaches initial operational capability. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Could the uh, chair inform me as to how much time is remaining on the gentleman from Massachusetts has three minutes remaining. The gentleman from California has two and a half minutes remaining. Okay, thank you. And I yield myself as much time as I may. Gentleman recognized. Thank you. Again, the, the experts all say that if we delay this just 10 years, which is all I'm asking for, 10 year delay, since the B-2s and the B-52s aren't retiring until beginning to retire from between 2040 and 2058, all that Mr. Welsh and Mr. Conyers and I are saying is if we delay it 10 years, there's still plenty of time to build them if there's a need, but to begin to build new things right now with this era of tremendous budget deficits, when we should just be trying to find a way to reduce our deficits, you know, balance this budget, it's just wasteful. It's wasteful. And I just want to balance the budget. And if we're wasting money on projects like this, uh, then we have no chance of doing uh, anything about this deficit reduction. So again, experience shows us that it only takes 16 years, not 30, to bring a new bomber from the drawing board to the runway. There are millions of families out there who are trying to get by with you know, a car that's a few years old and just keep it going. The, the Air Force has already spent over $6 billion refurbishing all these planes. They plan on spending billions more on refurbishing them. There's no reason to believe they can't go out to the year 2060. This is not the year for us to be spending this money. Uh, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from California. I yield 30 seconds to my friend and colleague, the gentlelady from Guam, Ms. Bordallo. Gentlelady from Guam is recognized for 30 seconds. Mr. Chairman, I oppose Amendment No. 11. It would delay research and development funding for the next-gen bomber. The bomber is critical to replacing an aging fleet. The new bomber is needed so we don't raid our readiness accounts. This is about the bomber carrying nuclear weapons. It does a lot more than just carry nukes. It deters aggressors and even provides maritime surveillance, especially in the Asia-Pacific area. Congress opposed a similar amendment last year, and as co-chair of the Long Range Strike Caucus, I urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment again this year, and I yield back. Gentleman from Massachusetts. You, uh, Mr. Chair, tell me how gentleman much. Gentleman from Massachusetts has one and one half minutes remaining. The gentleman from California has two minutes remaining. I, I, yield, my, I, I yield myself as much time as I may consume. Gentleman recognized. I just look at this from the perspective of an ordinary family. Uh, they've already got three cars in the driveway. Everyone says to them, You've got, you can go another 100000 on those three cars. And yet the decision is made by some of the family members, we're going to buy a brand new top-of-the-line car right now, even though the whole family is in debt. No, everyone in the neighborhood would think that's crazy. That's what we're doing here today. The, the majority is saying, let's build a brand new bomber, a gold-plated bomber that's been on the wish list of the Air Force for a generation even though we have plenty of bombers, nuclear bombers, in an era where there aren't any more nuclear sites that we can be bombing around the world, uh, and we're just going to waste the money. We should be balancing the budget. We have to tighten our belt, and I just urge the majority to reconsider this. Okay? We have to save the money, and there just are no targets, and there are plenty of bombers we have that can last out to 2060. I reserve the balance of my time.
Does the gentleman from Texas seek to control the time from, of the gentleman from As California? As unanimous consent to do so, Mr. Without Chairman. objection. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield one minute to the gentlelady from Missouri, member of the committee. The gentlelady from Missouri is recognized for one minute. Thank you very much. And I think this uh, amendment is very curious. When the uh, member of the, the Secretary of Defense came out with a new defense strategy last year, and they came out and said that the long range strike fighter, fighter is one of their top priorities, and yet a member of their own party is trying to uh, do away with that. And as you know, gentlemen, we had over 50% of the cuts so far have come from our national defense. And there's only a few things we're supposed to be doing here in Congress, and one of them is provide for the common defense. I have the honor of representing the B-2 bombers of Whiteman Air Force Base, and I couldn't be prouder of the good work that they are doing. But we have 19 right now aircraft, and if we approve this amendment, it would be over 50 years old by the time that we would be moving forward with looking at the future. And we'd have the B-2s at 75 years old, and I would use his analogy and say a family would not wait until the car is 50 years old, broken down the garage and won't start before they go consider advancing and getting a new car. We need to be proactive. We need to maintain that our defense industry remains strong. We need to be proactive. We need to oppose this amendment and continue to support our long-range strike fighters. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Gentleman from Massachusetts has 30 seconds remaining. And how much does the other side have? Gentleman has one minute remaining. <laughs> and uh, who has the right to close, Mr. Chairman? Gentleman from Texas does. Gentleman from Texas. Are you, are you the final speaker? Okay, great. Uh, I yield myself the remainder of my time. Thank you. Gentleman recognized. We're $15 trillion in debt, $15 trillion. We got all the bombers we need. They can last to 2060. Uh, we don't need a new nuclear bomber, okay? We just don't need a new nuclear bomber. They're, we don't have the targets for them. We can't afford them, and we don't need them. How's that for a combination? Let's just cut back on something in this defense budget. Does it have to be the entire wish list of every single defense contractor in the United States, regardless of whether or not it relates to any of the military needs of our country? And by the way, 30 or 40 years from now, $18 billion, we can postpone to 10 years, still have the brand new planes ready to go in 2050 and 2060. We should be saving money for this generation right now, not just passing it on to the next generation. I urge and I vote. Gentlemen, time has expired. Gentleman from Texas. Mr. Chairman, I yield 30 seconds to the gentlelady from South Dakota. Gentlelady from South Dakota is recognized for 30 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Earlier today, I was on this House floor commemorating the 70th anniversary of Ellsworth Air Force Base, which is in my great state of South Dakota. Uh, you know, our bomber fleet, the average age is 40 years old. Old dogs can learn new tricks, and our bombers are certainly doing that. They've been updated as much as they possibly can be, but they do eventually still get older. I will tell you that the B-1 bomber has performed admirably over the last three decades, and so has the B-2 and the B-52. But I will tell you, we must continue to upgrade and to maintain our bomber fleet. And I will tell you that prohibiting development of the new generation bomber for 10 years is short-sighted. It puts our national security at risk. I'm going to urge my colleagues to vote against this amendment. Governor from Texas. Mr. Chairman, I yield the remaining time to the distinguished ranking member of the Appropriations Committee, Mr. Dix. Gentleman from Washington has 30 seconds remaining. Uh, I, uh, I rise in strong opposition to the Markey Amendment. I know my friend is uh, trying to be humorous, but this is a very serious subject. Uh, I was one of the leaders on the work to do the B-2 bomber. That took us between 15 and 20 years. Now, the reason we're starting is we've got to pull this technology together and try to do this for less money. And uh, we need a long-range, modern, penetrating bomber with conventional weapons. The nuclear weapon isn't a priority to me. It's the smart, conventional weapons that give us an enormous capability. Let's vote no on the ill-conceived Markey Amendment. Question if he occurs. wants to look at something, tell him to look at land-based missiles. Question That's occurs on the, on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Massachusetts. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed, no? No. Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. On that, I request a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Massachusetts will be postponed. Thank you. Sure. It is now in order to consider Amendment Number 12, printed in House Report 112-485. For what purpose does the gentleman from Colorado seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment Number 12, printed in House Report Number 112-485, offered by Mr. Polis of Colorado. Pursuant to House Resolution 661, the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Polis, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California.
Thank you. I Col Colorado. Well, I think the chair said California. I said Colorado. I meant to say Colorado. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I yield myself such time as I may consume. Time is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chair, my amendment would reduce uh, funding for the failed ground-based mid-course uh, defense GMD program by 404 million. This missile defense program was designed to intercept limited, intermediate, and long-range intercontinental ballistic missiles before they re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Now, a fine idea, but the only problem is that while this failed missile defense program rarely hits anything, it continues to cost taxpayers billions of dollars. If we're going to target wasteful spending, then a missile defense program that can't hit its targets is a good place to achieve taxpayer savings. This program has documented failure after failure. In a time of large deficits and increasing debt, Congress should have to justify every penny that we spend of taxpayer money, and there isn't any justification for spending an additional $400 million on a weapons program that simply doesn't work. Since 1997, the system has failed more than half its test, missing its target nine and 17 times. A scheduled March flight test was canceled because they're still evaluating the previous failures. Lieutenant General Patrick O'Reilly, the director for the Missile Defense Agency, testified that the flight test failures weren't because of lack of funds. In fact, he said, quote, I don't think those failures would have been avoided if we would have had a larger or lesser budget than we had, end quote. This is not a problem that we can solve by throwing more taxpayer money and larger deficits after it. American taxpayers cannot afford a Congress that keeps spending money on programs that don't work. Now, I'm sure the other side will discuss the issues of why there's a strategic importance to a long-range missile threat and preventing attacks from North Korea and Iran, neither of which currently possess the ability to launch a missile. But a missile defense system that doesn't actually defend against missiles is no defense at all. My amendment would cut funding for this program by $400 million, just as the General Government Accountability Office, GAO, recommended. They took a close look at GMD and settled on a reasonable recommendation. We cut spending by $403 million. It's what my amendment is. To quote the GAO, until, until the failure review investigation is completed, mitigations are developed and proven in ground testing and then confirmed through flight testing, funding for GMD is premature. I wholeheartedly agree with the GAO and reserve the balance of my time. Chairman reserves the balance of his time. Gentleman from Texas. Mr. Chairman, I rise to claim the time in opposition. Gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this point, I'd yield two minutes to the subcommittee chairman of um, strategic forces, gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Turner. Gentleman's recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is the first in a number of amendments that are going to come from the other side of the aisle that are targeted at weakening our national defense missile defense system. Um, this is at a time that we see rising and increased threats from both Iran and North Korea. We have Secretary Gates having said that North Korea's programs are becoming an, an absolute threat to mainland United States. It also comes coincidentally at a time that our president has had what is known as the open mic incident, where he was in South Korea and when speaking with President Medvedev of Russia, indicated that he was hopeful for a time when he could get past this next election so he could have greater flexibility on missile defense. This secret deal that the president has with the Russians to weaken our missile defense is consistent with the amendments we're going to be seeing from the other side of the aisle. And we know the deal's secret because after the president returned back to the United States, we asked him. We asked the president to tell us what is this increased flexibility and what is his intention in weakening our missile defense system. And he won't tell us. So it remains a secret, but it's consistent with the amendments we're seeing on the other side of the aisle to weaken our national defense. Now, this amendment, disturbingly, tries to cut our ground-based mid-course defense system, which currently is the only system that actually protects mainland United States. It is part of the public portion of the president's plan and that this be sustained. Again, we don't know what his, his secret deal is. But this system actually includes the CE-1 interceptor, which is three for three in its successful intercepts. We know this is a system that works. We know this is a system that's important. And we also know that if, um, if people are on this floor are serious about trying to reduce the deficit, perhaps they should support the Ryan budget. With that, I yield back. Gentleman from Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A, a missile defense system that doesn't defend against missiles is no defense at all. And with that, I yield one minute to the gentleman from Washington, Jim, Mr. Smith. The gentleman from Washington is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to have to be quick because, first of all, I want to point out about the issue about the so-called open mic incident. I do thank Mr. Turner for accurately describing what happened, but he's wrong on one thing. The president did, in fact, respond as to what he meant. He sent a letter to Mr. Turner on April 13th explaining what he meant. And basically what he meant, well, I'm not, I don't have any time. I'm the, sorry. The letter I don't have any that. time. I can't yield. 
But you're, you're, can you read the letter? The gentleman from Washington controls the time. I read the letter. And, and it, could you read the gentleman it? from Washington controls the time. the time. What it says is basically what's obvious to everybody. The president has a different opinion. The president believes that Russia can be a partner to reduce missile threat and possibly work with them to develop missile defense systems that they don't feel threatened by. It's no big secret. It's what the president has said. Generally, the other side doesn't want to have anything to do with Russia. Okay, fine, but they are a factor. The president wants to figure out some way where we can work with someone who is no longer our enemy to reduce this threat. There's no great mystery here. That's what he's talking about. And I want to support Mr. Polis' amendment as well to say that the problem is we are going to need the ground based missile system. It's funded in the president's budget to a certain amount of money. But because it has been missing so often, there is a limited amount of money that you can spend testing this. It's not ready. They're spending money testing it. They just don't need the... Can I have an additional 15 seconds? So 15 seconds is number four. They just don't need this additional money. So we're not saying that we don't need missile defense. We're spending money on it. We're spending a lot of money on it. We're going to develop that. And the point on Russia is very simple and straightforward. The president would like to negotiate an understanding with Russia so that we are not in conflict with one another. And there are many who don't want us to have that conversation. I believe Mr. Turner is in that camp. The president would like to have that conversation. That's all he meant, and he explained it in this letter. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Texas. Mr. Chairman, I yield one and one-half minutes to the gentleman from Arizona, a member of the committee, Mr. Franks. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized for one and one-half minutes. And I thank the gentleman. You know, it can't be emphasized too often <clears throat> that our ground-based mid-course defense is the only tested system that we have that defends the homeland of the United States against the most dangerous and powerful weapons mankind has ever known. And I just somehow have a hard time cognitively grasping why a nuclear missile landing on our homeland doesn't alarm people a little bit more than it, it seems to. Uh, Assuming the SM-32B missile is able to provide protection for the homeland in that year, uh, an assumption GAO calls into question in fairly alarmed terms, this system will be the only system that we have that will be able to protect the homeland until at least 2020. And Mr. Chairman, we make a desperate mistake by whether, for whatever reason it is, whether it's secret deal with the Russians, whatever it is, to reduce the only system that protects the United States of America is folly. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman from Colorado. I'd like to inquire as to how much time remains on both gentleman sides. Gentleman from Colorado has one and three-quarter minutes remaining. The gentleman from Texas has two and a half minutes remaining. Sure. What the, what the, the gentleman from Arizona uh, failed to acknowledge that the sim system simply doesn't work, missing its target more than half the time, and you can't solve a problem by throwing more government money after it, as the gentleman from Arizona is advocating. I'd like to yield one moment, one minute, to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Andrews. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for one minute. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my Without objection. Uh, everyone here is alarmed, Mr. Speaker, about the possibility of a nuclear attack on the United States. We all should be alarmed about sticking to the facts in the debate. Fact is, we're talking about a weapon system here that failed two tests in 2010 and hasn't passed a test since 2008. The fact that is, in the meantime, we have a robust, successful, tested regional system that can protect the homeland of the country. And the fact is that the general who runs this program said, in the program right now, we are addressing and are prepared to come back to flight testing. But we've had two failures. And no matter what budget we're dedicating, we have to get over those flight test failures. Fix it first. Fund it later. Support the Polis Amendment. Gentleman from Texas. Chairman, I yield one and one-half minutes to the gentleman from Colorado, distinguished member of the gentleman committee, from Mr. Gentleman Colorado Lambert. is recognized for one and one-half minutes. I thank the gentleman from Texas. I do have the honor of representing Colorado Springs in my congressional district, which has Missile Defense Agency and some of these other important assets for our nation's defense. And I totally oppose this amendment from my colleague from northern Colorado. You know, we do have ground-based interceptors on the west coast. We have ground-based interceptors in Alaska. We need them also on the east coast. We need to start planning for that. The money that would be slashed by this amendment would go to starting the planning process. And it doesn't happen overnight. It's a multi-year process. We need to start the planning now so we can defend the heavy population centers on the East Coast from intercontinental miss ballistic missile threats. 
there are rogue nations in this world that mean us harm. There are the, there's the possibility of an accidental launch by a number of countries. We have to have that type of defense. The Institute for Defense Analysis did a study that Congress called for. They said we need an East Coast site. The money in this amendment, should this amendment pass, that money will not be there to begin that process. Unfortunately, Barack Obama has been slashing missile defense for three years now. This bad amendment would continue that same trend. The CE-1 interceptor has worked three out of three times. That's a hundred percent record. And I disagree with the gentleman from New Jersey who just spoke who said fix it first and then fund it. It's the other way around. You fund it so you can fix it. They have it backwards, I'm afraid. A vote for this amendment is really nothing more than a vote against a strong missile defense for the United States. I'd urge a no vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman from Colorado. Well, I uh, was encouraged to hear my colleague from Colorado to say you fund it so you can fix it. I hope that uh, quotation could also be used with regard to education and health care in this country to ensure that everybody has access uh, to, to a good education and the opportunities it can provide. Look, my amendment is a small step towards a sane defense budget. It would make a modest cut to a failed program that you simply cannot, by the military's own recognition, to expect to fix by continuing to throw good money after bad. I would urge the House to listen to the experts, listen to our military leaders, Listen to independent auditors who are telling us not to throw good money after bad. Let's get defense budget on the right track by spending money on our service members and our programs that are proven to protect our country successfully. But let's not spend additional money on a missile defense system that simply doesn't work. It should be targeted for savings in this bill. It should be fixed, and at that time we can reconsider additional funding of this program. But there's ample funding with these reductions. I urge my colleagues to vote yes on the Polis Amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman from Texas. Mr. Chairman, I yield the remaining time to Mr. Turner. The gentleman's recognized for one minute. I want to encourage everyone to oppose this amendment, which again is the first of a series of amendments from the other side of the aisle to weaken our national missile defense system. This is the only deployed system that we have that protects mainland United States. And it is consistent with the President's secret deal. The President has never answered our request as to what are the terms of his secret deal with the Russians, where the President, in a meeting with Medvedev, said, I have greater flexibility after I get past the election. Imagine the audacity of saying that when he's no longer subject to the electorate, that he's going to disclose a new missile defense deal or arrangement with the Russians. In fact, Putin himself acknowledges the agreement. In a March 2, 2012 interview with um, a Russian newspaper, he indicates that uh, they made us a pro proposal just during the talks. They told us we would offer you this, we'd offer you that, and they asked him to put it down on paper. There are ongoing negotiations between this administration and the Russians. The president got caught in an open mic. There's a secret deal with the Russians that the president needs to answer to. This amendment would weaken our national defense and our missile defense system, as would the president's secret deal with the Russians. Vote no on this amendment. question occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Colorado. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. Opinion chair, the noes have it. Mr. Chairman, on that I request uh, the yeas and the nays. Soon to clause six of Rule 18, the gentleman requests a recorded vote. I do. The gentleman, I request a recorded vote. Pursuant to clause eight of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Colorado will be postponed. For what purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, pursuant to HRS 661, I offer amendments in block. Clerk will designate the amendments in block. On block number two, consisting of amendments numbered 33, 36, 65, 66, 75, 85, 89, 93, 98, 100, 104, 124, 127, and 128, printed in House Report number 112-485, offered by Mr. McKeon of California. Resolution 661, the gentleman from California, Mr. McKeon, and the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Smith, each will control 10 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Georgia for the purpose of a colloquy. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for two minutes. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I rise to commend the Armed Services Committee on their good work in the number of areas of the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2013. But I have a concern with the report language from Section 815 that I would like to bring to the Chairman of the Committee's uh, attention. I certainly approve of utilizing competition to both improve 
contract performance and cost effectiveness of weapon systems. However, I want to bring to attention the fact that the C-17 and its F-117 engines have been a model of modern sustainment. Today, time on wings for uh, the F-17 engine has doubled since the start of this sustainment program while making multiple design and hardware upgrades. Today, the F-17 engines are sustained through an award-winning performance based on logistics contracts that minimizes life cycle costs with fixed fees based on flight cycles. This contract type requires comprehensive understanding and investment by the service provider along with the engineering design expertise to develop and implement improvements in response to the actual mission. I support the use of every practical means of providing for the efficient defense of this country and the protection of our warfighters. That includes the appropriate use of competition and any other contracting method that incentivizes positive outcomes for cost effectiveness and performance. In fact, the Air Force has taken steps to ensure these outcomes are achieved on the C-17 sustainment contract. As we push the Air Force and other services to extend the practices further, we must always keep reliability and readiness of the weapon systems in mind. I look forward to working with the Chairman to address these issues in conference, and I yield to the gentleman from California. I thank the gentleman from Georgia for his remarks and his strong support for the readiness of our armed forces. There's no doubt that our C-17 fleet is doing a remarkable job around the globe, and I assure the gentleman that this committee strongly shares in your desire to ensure that the C-17 continues to perform magnificently for many, many years to come. And I thank the chairman. Expired. For what purpose is the gentleman from Washington rise? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield one and a half minutes to the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Boswell. The gentleman from Iowa is recognized for one and one half minutes. Revise, extend, extend. What? Request. Did I ask consent? Revise, extend. Revise and extend. Revise and extend. I'm sorry. I've got more Without objection, so ordered. I, I well, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of the M Block for a couple of reasons I think are very important to all of us. Uh, as we know, the amendments that I'm con concerned in talking about has to do with the issue of multiple diplomats and to add to the Armed Forces Breast Cancer Research Act of 212 to the underlying legislation. Amendment 216 requires the Secretary of Defense to submit a report on the effects that multiple diplomats have on the well-being of our military personnel. And I, along with some of you, have some appreciation for multiple de uh, deployments. We used to call them tours, but we understand that uh, with the de deployments and the impact on our troops and uniform and our families is uh, severe. We need to know more about it. The other is I had a former staffer that uh, went to a five-year re uh, reunion, a uh, female staffer. She's an Iraq War veteran, and she returned to tell me that six of the six of the 70 women her battalion, ages 25 to 35, had been diagnosed with breast cancer, and others had non-cancerous masses. This startled me, and so we did a study that indicates breast cancer is more prevalent in military women than civilian. But women are not the only ones that need this study. At last count, at least 78 men from who served at Camp Lejeune between 1950 and 1985 been diagnosed with breast cancer. These Marines or families deserve more information. Last Congress, the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America and the VFW supported conducting the study. More troops are returning from duty only to face a new battle, breast cancer, so I urge my colleagues to get them answers. Support this in block amendment and the other good features of it. Thank you, and I yield back. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, I yield one minute to my friend and colleague, the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Flake. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized for one minute. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I thank him for uh, including in this unblock amendment uh, an amendment that myself and the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Mulvaney, offered uh, to ensure that uh, we budget honestly. Uh, we have something called the Overseas um, uh, Contingent Operations Account, or OCO. And uh, this, we fear, that is sometimes used uh, to put in items that we don't want to become part of the budget, that are above the budget or outside of the budget. Uh, this amendment will ensure that those items in this account are war-related. 
and not simply items uh, to get around budget constraints and the budget that we have uh, established uh, for defense. And so I, I thank the gentleman for putting this in. This is an important amendment. Uh, we've got to ensure that we budget honestly and, and make sure that uh, in the future uh, we know what our budget is, we know what uh, accounts are, um, are, are doing, and, uh, and this is a good step in that direction. So thank you. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Washington. Who seeks time? Yep. Gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I yield myself uh, three minutes. Gentleman from Washington is recognized for three minutes. Thank you. I want to take this moment, we have a little, little extra time in this one, to talk a little bit about Afghanistan and to express our opinion since we weren't able to get our amendment ruled in order. It's important for all the members of the floor to understand that the base bill has language on Afghanistan. And the base bill calls for us keeping 68,000 troops in Afghanistan until the end of 2014 and then makes unspecified requests to make sure that we have sufficient troops to accomplish a series of missions after 2014. It very aggressively calls for a large troop presence in Afghanistan for an extended period of time. I and many members on this side of the aisle, as well as some on the others, oppose that. We do not think that keeping that many troops in Afghanistan for that long is in the best interests of our national security or our country. And the bulk of the country agrees with us on that. Unfortunately, we weren't offered the opportunity to offer our amendment that offers what I think is a better approach. I'm also going to reluctantly oppose Representative Lee's amendment, the only alternative we were given, which is to pull us out as fast as we can, safely and responsibly. Representative Lee's amendment does not allow us to maintain any sort of counterterrorism mission, which I do think is critically important. The amendment we wanted to offer was to put us on a more aggressive, quicker drawdown pace to speed up transition to the Afghan forces for security while enabling us with a relatively small number of troops to maintain that counterterrorism mission. We have trained over 350 Afghan national security forces. They have taken over responsibility for an increasing number of provinces and districts throughout the country and for an increasing number of security responsibilities. It is time to make that transition. And my objection to the base bill is it doesn't give us the opportunity to make that transition because it mistakenly believes that the key to Afghan stability is keeping as many U.S. troops in Afghanistan for as long as possible. Having that large of a foreign military force, as we have seen, there's been a huge increase in attacks by Afghan forces on U.S. forces. We had the Koran burning incident. We had the horrible incident uh, of a soldier going off and killing allegedly killing 16 or 17 civilians in Afghanistan. Our presence at this point is in and of itself destabilizing. What we want is a responsible drawdown of that force. We don't want to do it hastily in a way that jeopardizes the mission or jeopardizes Afghanistan. That was the purpose of the amendment that I, along with uh, Congressman McGovern and others, authored. And it is unfortunate that for reasons that I cannot understand, the majority refused to allow us the opportunity to debate that. Now, as I said earlier, I speculated that part of the reason is because they know that the American people agree with us. It's a debate they don't want to have and a vote they don't want to take. And I respect that. Uh, as a number of my colleagues have joked to me over the years, the toughest part about this job is voting. Um, that's when people actually see where you stand. And there have been many times when I'll yield myself an additional one minute. The gentleman's recognized for one additional minute. There have been many times where I wish I didn't have to do that, but it comes with the job, and particularly on something as important as Afghanistan. I don't think anyone dis would dispute the most important thing about this bill the Armed Services Committee bill this year, is what's going on in Afghanistan. Single most important issue, we're denied the opportunity to have a vote of what I think is a much better plan and leave in place in the base bill a call for having 68,000 troops in Afghanistan until the end of 2014. It is very simple. The majority is in favor of a larger troop presence for a longer period of time. We are in favor of a smaller troop presence for a shorter period of time. I believe it's the better policy. I regret that we will not have the opportunity to vote on it. But as we go into conference, I will strenuously argue this point. It is a major flaw, I believe, in an otherwise very strong bill. Uh, and with that, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves his time. The gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized for as much time as he may consume.